Hey guys, and welcome back to the channel, Daughter of Increase. My name is Nate Denise, for those of you who are new to the channel or who just happen to stumble across this video. And I post new videos every Wednesday all about my faith, God, Christ, and expanding the kingdom of God. And I do that through Bible studies, book reviews, discussions, and more. So today's video, as the title says, is going to be a new sort of study series. And I am nervous to do this. <laughs> But um, it has been requested time and time again that I do more of the sit down Bible studies where I'm not really zooming in on my journaling Bible. And I'm not going to lie, I'm a lot more comfortable doing that because <laughs> it allows me just to freely talk. But um, this is definitely going to be a different setup, a different style of doing a Bible study. So as you guys can see, this is going to be a scripture study. And um, this is going to be on David and Goliath. Now, initially, I was going to use my Bible journal to show you guys and go through the notes and all. But God has definitely been telling me to switch it up along with you guys have been telling me to switch it up. And I don't want to make it too easy for you all. Um, I definitely want to give you all the opportunity to just go and journal the word for yourself. So this is a sit down video. Um, I have my Bible here already open to the scripture that we're going to be studying today. I also have the notes. If you guys do not have the notes, I do have them available right now for five bucks. It's 29 pages of notes strictly on the story of David and Goliath. Uh, yeah, 29 pages. Don't, don't ask me why. Um, I wanted to try my hand at doing Bible study workbooks and booklets, um, there's some things that God is working on within me as far as the ministry and really making a lot more interactive notes and things like that. Because you guys know my notes, I tend to just go in Word and type them out, print them out. There we go. Um, but God said step out uh, before the end of 2021 and here we are. So I have that. I have a pen handy just in case. I have a hot drink. So if you don't have a hot drink, grab one. I am hoping this video is no longer than 45 minutes but we'll see but um yeah i have my hot drink here it is a cappuccino and let's just jump right into this video so before we dive in i do want to do a quick prayer which we know how i feel about prayer right okay <laughs> um so let's just pray real quick Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time, this opportunity just to study your word and to dive deep. Lord, I'm asking that you come into our hearts, come into our minds, come into this space and this time that we're able to commune together with you and to just study your word, Lord. I'm asking that you use me to speak whatever it is you would have me to speak to your people, God. I'm asking that this word gets, in, gets embedded in them and that it takes root and that it's able to sit and allow them to apply it to their lives in a better way better way excuse me um lord i also just ask that anyone who comes back to watch the replay will take this time to study it for themselves and to interact in the comment section and to ask their questions and that we from this study are able to grow closer in our walk with you amen so quick little prayer yeah, you you guys know I, I i love prayer but i get nervous praying for people so we working on it uh yeah so <laughs> um again i do have the notes available on the blog you can just go to the blog shop link is down below and just purchase it it is five dollars as of now um and it is 29 pages chuck full of just questions notes definitions just everything and i'm going to walk through the entire thing with you all um so yeah i'm going to begin with um the icebreaker so i did include an icebreaker in the packet just because i feel like sometimes when we study the word of god we tend to get a little nervous or we start to overthink things and that's never that never should be the case when we are studying the word of god the word of god is very um free and open and we should be that same way into going and in, going into study the word of god excuse me so the first two questions are are you currently facing any fears and what do you think is required to overcome those fears? Now, I am facing a lot of fears um, per personally right now, especially with um, Daughter of Increase and Daughter of Grace and just ministry in as a whole, um, be it my personal ministry, my dance ministry, or even within church ministry. There are a lot of things that I'm facing that um, tend to bring fear about in my life. So, yeah. 
Um, and what do you think is required to overcome fear? Well, I know the answer to that, so I'm not really going to give the answer, but I would love for you guys to just t uh, chat in the comment boxes below and uh, let me know what you guys think is required to overcome fear. Again, I know the answer, so I'm not going to say it. Um, then the next question is, what's one fear that we as believers are required to have? Now, of all the fears there is one specific fear that we are as believers required to have and i'm not going to tell you guys but it is in the book of proverbs so you should know the answer after me saying that right um and then in the story of david and goliath who are you are you david are you goliath are you the israelites are you the philistines are you saul like who are you in the story of david and goliath and i know for me growing up um a lot of my church would tell me you know in the story of David and Goliath be like David you're David you're David but in reality that's not true um I got older I grew up and I studied it for myself and I really was able to see the connections um of Jesus throughout the story of David and Goliath so who do you think you are in that story I'm not going to answer it because I do know the answer to that um now keep in mind there are no right or wrong answers but um there's a right answer and I'll explain towards the end what I mean. So um, the next thing that is in the packet on page four is going to be some study questions. And it's just some five W's and one H. Real simple questions you can think of while going through the text. So like who is speaking in the passage? Who are they speaking to? What is going on in the passage? Why is this happening? Where is this taking place? When did this happen? And how the problem is solved? Um, these are just some basic questions. You can definitely go beyond these questions. I would suggest you go beyond these questions, but they're just basic questions um, to keep you really focused while studying this text. So following that, we have the study aims. And for this, I really only have three main focal study aims. Um, the first is that there are no limits to what God can do through those who trust in him completely. And then I also have some cross references for each of those for you guys. So you can, if you have the package, you can open up to page five and um, look at that. The second one is that faith is a necessary component in living victorious in Christ. And the third is that we need to be confident that God can defeat the giants in our lives if we trust him to work on our behalf. And we're going to see this happen with David and Goliath shortly. So before we dive directly into, you know, the verses, I do want to do a little bit of chapter setup because there are some key things that happened um, in chapter 16 and 17 prior to the battle of David and Goliath. So we have David, who was the least of his seven older brothers, but he was already anointed king back in chapter 16. Um, we see that it, it's literally called David anointed king. Um, chapter 16 It's going to be verses one all the way to verse 13 and that's where we see that he is being anointed as the king but Saul is already king keep that in mind um and then we have Goliath who is this nine feet nine inch man who wore armor that weighed over 126 pounds and then he had a spearhead staff that weighed 15 pounds so he's literally like a giant to these people nine feet I've never seen anybody that's nine feet I see people that's seven feet maybe eight feet but I've never seen anyone nine feet um, and I'm short, so I'm only like 14. So that that's a big difference for me, okay? That, that's a huge difference, okay? Um, he also, Goliath, taunted the Israelites for 40 days and 40 nights on the land that belonged to the tribe of Judah. So you have this giant who comes to your land, to your territory, and who is now taunting you consistently day after day, night after night, for 40 days and nights, okay? And we know that 40 days and 40 nights is always in the Bible. 40 days and 40 nights okay i can definitely do like a whole study on just 40 days and 40 nights on its own but that's not what this is about today um and then the next point is that the israelites were afraid of goliath's appearance they had much to lose and they immediately became greatly and dreadfully afraid of goliath and this is written actually in scripture um if you read the previous verses in chapter 17 you will see that it's literally written in scripture and then the last point that I want to make to set this whole chapter up is that David came to the battlefield to deliver food to his brothers. Um, he delivered food to the soldiers. And when he got there, he saw how people reacted. He saw that his people was afraid of this giant. And um, that's when he decided to immediately take action. Okay. So that is that. 
So what I'm going to do now is just dive into the scripture text. I am going to be reading out of the New King James translation. That is my preferred translation. I love that translation. Um, but if you have the ESV, the CSV, the NLT, the NIV, the KJV, whichever translation you have, be comfortable with that translation translation and read it but i am going to read from the new king james so i am going to be reading from verse 31 all the way to verse 51 okay so starting at verse 31 it says now when the words which david spoke were heard they reported them to saul and he sent for them then david said to saul let no man's heart fail because of him your servant will go and fight with this philistine and Saul said to David, you are not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Verse 36, your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Verse 38. So Saul clothed David with his armor and he put a bronze helmet on his head and he also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor, and he tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Verse 40, when he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag, in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ready and good-looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword with a spear and with a javelin but i come to you in the name of the lord of hosts the god of the armies of israel whom you have defied verse 36 this day the lord will deliver you into my hand and i will strike you and take your head from you and this day i will give the carcasses of the camp of the philistine to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a god in israel then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with the sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David that David hurried and ran forward and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. I'm actually going to go to verse 52. Now the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road to Sharem, even as far as Gath and Ekron. So that is the reading of the word. <laughs> and um, at this point, normally when I'm doing my journaling, I would define some words and I already have some words defined um, if you look on pages seven and eight of your notes if you have it you definitely can um, find those there and I'll also leave a little space for you all to define your own words now keep in mind when you are going to define any words that you want to understand more you're going to look these up in the Greek definition the original definition not in the English I always say when you're studying the Word of God look up words in their original language because 
one word can mean something completely different from what we use it as okay so um i definitely would say that because for example in verse 32 it says fail it says let no man's heart fail and to us that just means um don't get it wrong don't do wrong but however when you're looking it up in the uh hebrew definition did i say greek the old testament you're looking up in hebrew and in the new testament you're looking up in greek so this is the old testament so you would look up the original definition in hebrew and in hebrew fail is nafal and it means to cease to fall into a deep sleep to cast down to abandon to figuratively have a sinking heart and that is completely different from what we use the word fail as in our english modern language so i definitely would say look it up in the original language and the original language for the old testament is Hebrew and Aramaic, but in this sense, you would look it up in the Hebrew and you would use a concordance, be it a physical concordance or an online concordance. I know I have a video coming up soon on how to use a uh, Bible hub. It's coming. All right. So um, I'm not going to get into all of the definitions, but um, definitely I didn't look up that many definitions. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine words that I looked up. Um, so it's not that many. Uh, so yeah, so now we're going to get into the actual study of the scripture. So I'm going to put my Bible right here to the side and I'm going to focus on these notes. Um, if I'm looking down, it's because I'm actually looking at the notes. There are a lot of papers here, so bear with me with this new setup and new way of studying, okay? All right, uh, so we're going to start at uh, verse 32 as far as like breaking down. So David begins by saying, let no man's heart fail because of him. So David, he arrives here at the battlefield. He's bringing food and he immediately sees that his people, the people of God, the Israelites are afraid of the Philistines because of this huge man. I mean, nine foot, nine inches. I, I ain't gonna lie. I'm short. I'd be scared too. I'd be like, I ain't fighting him. It's over. I would immediately think that way. Um, but what's interesting is, is he said, let's let no man's heart fail. Now, keep in mind that fail is um, to have a sinking heart, to fall into a deep sleep. So don't let your heart fall into a deep sleep because of this giant that you see in front of you, because this giant compared to God is nothing. And this lets me know that they immediately forgot who God was and his faithfulness to them. They were not aware of of um, all the things that God brought them through. He brought them out of Egypt. He saved their lives from Pharaoh. He um, did so much for them, but they forgot that and immediately was afraid of this giant. And I know for me, there are times where I will forget all that God has done for me, his faithfulness, his love, his caring. Um, when something that is big gets in front of me, I tend to forget that. Um, and there are moments where I'm just like the Israelites. So I'm just like, okay, that looks, that looks scary. That looks a little too crazy for me. So I'm not going to deal with that. I'm just going to stay here and wait, um, and prayerfully someone comes to, you know, figure it out for me. And, um, we see that immediately. And then the cross reference I have for that is Deuteronomy 20 verse three and four. And I'm going to quickly flip to that. I probably should have fixed my Bible to immediately have those scriptures available, but I didn't. So Deuteronomy 20. And Deuteronomy 20 verses 1 through 5 in general is a good scripture to look at because I have used that as a cross reference many times. But I said verses 3 and 4. So um, 3 and 4, I'm going to pop the scripture up so you guys can read along. It says, And he shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Do not let your heart faint. Do not be afraid and do not tremble. Or be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. So they have been told time and time again from the beginning of time to not be afraid of anything. But they immediately, because of this man's appearance and what it looked like, they decided not to look at it with a spiritual eye but a natural eye. And a lot of the times when we look at things with a natural eye we run i've done it plenty of times where i looked at things naturally and i was just like god i can't do it I'm, I'm done i'm not gonna do it um but when you change your perception and you look through your spiritual eyes things don't look as scary um and those things that are like giants in our lives we can definitely overcome them so then he goes to say to um saul he says your servant will go and fight with this philistine so david immediately takes action against Goliath. He doesn't sit and ponder. He doesn't become afraid. He doesn't double think. He immediately takes action. He showed courage in the face of fear. And we're told, be strong, be courageous. The Bible tells us. 
but we don't do it. Um, after 40 days and 40 nights of waiting, someone finally had the goal to stand up for God. David knew what it was like to put his life on the line as a shepherd protecting his sheep. Now, keep in mind, everything in the Old Testament is a reflection of Christ. And at this point, we can see that David was a shepherd over sheep, okay? Jesus is a shepherd over sheep. He makes correlations of that. He talks about parables about that in scripture. And um, this just lets me know and brings about the questions of, are you able, or not are you able, but are you bold enough to face your fears and circumstances? There are some times where I'm not bold enough to do that. I'm not going to lie. There are some things currently that I'm facing that I'm just like, I don't think I could do that. So I don't do it. I sit back and just wait for God to do something um but that's not what you're supposed to do like David you're supposed to immediately take action trusting in God then the next question I have is will you stand up for God when others think you should run I'm pretty sure because this is David he was a little boy um not not a little boy in a sense but most likely in his teens and these are all grown men in the army who are afraid of nine foot nine inch giant with all this armor I'm pretty sure they were like what is he doing he needs to run but he stood up for God when no one else would. And this reminds me that Jesus will always stand up for God. He always stood up for God, even when others didn't. So as a believer, as a follower of Christ, I should also stand up for God when others around me won't. But sometimes we don't, unfortunately, because we immediately allow our flesh to take over. But we need to remind ourselves, like David, we need to immediately take action. We need to stand up for God when no one else will. Um, and the cross-reference I have for that is going to be John 10, verse 11. So then going down, I'm going to go to verse 33. Um, in verse 33, we see that Saul is having a conversation with David, okay? And what's interesting is that Saul knows God, right? We know that Saul knows God. He 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 has a relationship with God. We know that further on in the scripture, he fails. But um, in this part of scripture, we understand that he understands who God is. He has a relationship with God. So he says to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. As a king and as a believer, instead of Saul encouraging David, he did the complete opposite and discouraged David. He um, he exudes a fear and he looked at the battle in a natural sense and not in a spiritual sense. He did not see God's presence in David's life or among the people. And a lot of the times I know for me, there are some situations when I'm looking at people like, what you doing? You ain't supposed to be doing that. That don't look right. Um, and again, I'm looking with a natural eye. But if I were to change my perception and look at things with a spiritual eye, then I would understand that, okay, well, maybe they can't do it, but I know that they have a relationship with God. So because of God and God's presence in their lives, then maybe they can go ahead and deal with that situation but Saul didn't do that Saul immediately was like okay you ain't nothing but a shepherd you a little boy compared to all these men you've never been in the army you've never been on the battlefield you can't do it and as a leader as someone that people look up that a person looks up to he should not have done that I don't know if you guys have ever experienced someone that you looked up to kind of discourage you I don't recall me really ever having to deal with that I've been blessed with amazing teachers um, and the reason why I'm using teachers is because a lot of the times in in the school system we have teachers who some of them are very encouraging and some of them are discouraging to their students and I've never been put in a situation where I was discovered from any of my teachers like ever um, which I'm very very grateful for but if you've ever been in that situation then you know what it feels like but what's shocking to me is that David didn't let that stop him um, but we're gonna continue because not only did he say you're not able to go so you can't do it but he also decided to say for you are a youth and he a man of war from his youth so now he's trying to disqualify David. So not only did you not encourage him, you discouraged him. Um, now you're disqualifying him because of his appearance. And what's funny is that a lot of people will try to disqualify you because of how you look. Okay, they will try to disqualify you for how you look. Um, for me, I know the feeling of people looking at you, looking at your appearance and quickly disqualifying you. I worked at um, Macy's back in 2012 and I worked at a beauty counter. And I'm short. I look like a baby. Um, I'm not a baby. 
gonna be 20 i'm 29 I'll be 30 next year uh but i have a baby face i am very petite i am very short so when i was at this makeup counter i had a lot of older women come i worked at macy's as an on-call beauty advisor and um basically what that meant was any counter that had an open slot i was able to take so i was a floater among counters but i mainly worked at lancome estee lauder clinique chanel sometimes clarence but um i mainly preferred lancome that was where i really like my love was for lancome and i love the, the workers there and everything so lancome they have makeup products but they are i would say geared more so toward older women because of their serums or skincare products or cleansers and things like that so we would have a lot of older women come to the counter and i'll never forget this one time when this lady she came twice to the counter and um the first time she came she wouldn't let me help her because i looked like okay my parents disqualified me automatically in her mind she would not let me help her so the second time that she came to the counter there was no one else there to really assist because everyone was on lunch break and um the other person that was with me was also an on-call beauty advisor so it was either me or the other person so i went to her i walked up to her and i said ma'am may i help you and um she wanted to get her makeup done she wanted to buy some of the skincare products so i was like well i can do your makeup now i don't have the long home outfit because i am not a long home employee i am a on-call beauty advisor so i work for whatever counters open she immediately was like well i don't know because you're young and i'm just like ma'am um i'm in my 20s i can help you i'm a makeup artist i know what i'm doing uh, so i was polite of course and you know she sat down she was very very like jittery and didn't really trust me with her face but in the end she loved it and it's just like it reminds me that people will automatically look at you and assume things because of how you look to them your appearance to them and keep in mind that uh samuel did this with david um he did this with david's brothers he immediately saw his older brothers and thought their appearance was what made them set as king but god said no you look at the outward but i look at the inward and um that reminds me is that god's warrior does not look like the warrior of the world um god uses the young to confound the old excuse me he uses the foolish to confound the wise he will use the person without to humble the person with um he uses the opposite of what the world would think you would use so the world will say use a strong man use someone with muscles someone who who's who's rugged someone who doesn't look pretty um someone who has the height the stature god said no no i'm gonna use this young boy who looks like nothing because he's been working in the field but keep in mind him working in the field david working in the field prepared him for the battlefield and to become king that's a whole nother story so yeah um the cross reference i have for that is going to be first timothy um verse 4 12 i mean sorry first timothy chapter 4 verse 12 so we are going to now move ahead to verse 36. So it says, your servant has killed both lion and bear. So again, as I was saying, David was prepared already for what was to come while he was a shepherd. He battled a lion and a bear. A lion and a bear may not seem like much to a nine foot, nine inch giant, but for a normal person compared to these men who are in the army, that's a big, that's a big difference. That takes a lot of faith. That takes a lot of courage. That takes a lot of stamina to fight a lion and a bear for a sheep. I mean, come on. Um, he protected his flock from danger and harm. And this foreshadows his coming protection of Israel as its true king. Um, so again, there's a lot of foreshadowing that's taking pe taking place in these verses. There's a lot of correlations and representation of Christ in um, the story of David and Goliath. So then David says this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. So he now named Goliath, not as a giant, but as one who is not of God's people. And sometimes when we look at our fears, we look at our circumstances, we don't name them for what they're doing. We don't name them for who they are. We just say, okay, that's a giant. That's Goliath. I'm afraid. No, you have to name it for what it is. Like, okay, this is in my way, but it's not just stopping me. It's now coming against God. It's now um, disrespecting my, my, my father. It's now doing whatever it's doing to bring opposition for me. Um, so he was now past the stage and he, meaning David, was now past the stage of thinking he could kill David. Now he was confident that he would. Because if you go back to verse... 32 he says your servant will go and fight with this philistine so he's now saying i'll go i'll fight him he's not saying he'll win he's not you know he's not thinking anything like that he's saying i'll go so 
at this point he's like maybe i could win maybe i could not but when you get to verse 36 he said this arc this uncircumcised philistines will be like one of them one of them being the lion and the bear that he killed so now he's getting more confident as he's moving forward and no one knows if david had any fear in him i'm pretty sure he had some bit of fear but his faith overpowered that fear so now because he's moving in faith his confidence is increasing he's remembering god his confidence is increasing and he's not allowing it to stop him so the question is, can you call out and name your fears? Can you call them out for what they are? Can you name them for what they are? Not just, okay, I'm afraid of going back to school. Why are you afraid of going back to school? What is the opposition about? What is causing you to have that fear? Name it. Because when you begin to name it, now you can begin to move forward and allow your faith to trump that fear. Um, fears are literally things that we think are going to uh, sort of knock us down, but they can't. Um, so then he says, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. David also named that Gol what Goliath has done to God's chosen people. Can you name what your fear is doing in your life? So not only can you name your fear, but can you name and explain what it's doing to your life? Because you are a child of God. You are a, a daughter of the king. You are a son of the king. Whatever is coming against you is not just coming against you. It's coming against God. So you have to name those things for what they are and name what it is doing to your relationship with God so that now you can move forward with it. In verse 37, it says, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. So David remembered how God saved and helped him when he wasn't prepared to fight these animals. I'm sure David was just like, okay, Lord, what am I going to do? Lord, help me out, Lord. I'm pretty sure he was sitting there praying to God as he had to deal with this lion and this bear. Um, he had wholehearted true faith in God. He didn't rely on his own strength. He didn't rely on his own power because he knew that in his power and his strength, he could not defeat a lion and a bear. I don't know about y'all, but I seen a bear. I went to, I went to William Patterson University and, um, jersey and let me just say they had bears and bears just everywhere everywhere and um i i, I couldn't do it i i could not say that i would stand there and remember god at that point in time i'd probably be like okay let me run this way lord save me while i'm running but i'm pretty sure david didn't have that kind you know that kind of faith he um stood there and he dealt with it and he allowed god to use him to kill that lion and that bear um he also remembered what god did for him then and he understands that he was the same god then that could still deliver him now so there are so many times where i'm just like god and i'm going to use working for an example um many of you guys know i don't work i am a stay-at-home mom um and i work but when i say work i mean in the sense of how the world perceives working with you getting a paycheck i don't get a, a paycheck weekly bi-weekly none of that i might get money every two months or so um, if I do a makeup job here and there, I'll get paid, but I do not have a steady income that comes into my pockets, okay? Um, there are so many times where I'm just like, God, okay, well, I need to do this, this, that, and the third. And I forget that from 2012 till now, he's been helping me. God has been sustaining me. He's been sustaining my son. He's been providing for all the things that I needed and wanted, um, be it through my mother, my brothers, my son's father, through you guys. Like, he's been providing for me. So what makes me think that he couldn't still provide for me in the same situations from now on? And there's times where I literally have to be reminded. Like, there was a Sunday that my, my bishop literally had to speak to me. He was speaking to me from God, speaking to me from God. Um, and let me know that there are certain things that I need to stop doing. Like I always would say I don't work or I'm not making money. And God had to remind me to stop saying that because I have the capacity and the ability to do so. But I get afraid to do so, which is why now I charge just a little bit for notes because I was afraid to do so. But this was a talent and a gift that God gave me, not just to share the gospel and to teach the word, but also to provide for myself and for my son so i need to understand that god is the same god back then he protected me back then when i was dealing with things and he'll protect me now when i'm dealing with things so david automatically remembered that and the cross reference i have for that is going to be zechariah 4 and 6 so then we see that saul says to david go and the lord be with you so you can see that saul understands that god is needed but he still lacked true faith because if you understood that God was needed for David to go and fight Goliath, why wasn't you thinking the same thing when you and your men were dealing with Goliath on your own? 
why did it take a little child? And I'm calling him a little child because compared to Saul and the rest of these men, David was a child compared to them. But I'm pretty sure he's a teenager in this in this time. Um, but it's like when you're going through and someone else is going through, you're able to tell them, yes, try God, do this with God, go to God. But you immediately forget to do it for yourself. And that's how I see it with Saul and David. Saul was like, okay, well, God can't help us. But if you won't go, wouldn't God be with you? Um, but isn't he the same father that you worship isn't he the same father that you pray to isn't that the same god or am i confused um so i thought that was interesting that you dealt with this for 40 days and 40 nights and none of you thought of god in 40 days and 40 like none of you the same god that protected you back then couldn't protect you now but it took david to come it took david to stand up for god for y'all to really snap out of it but I'm going to get to that further because there's a point that I want to make with that. Um, so now we're going to move to verse 38 where it says that Saul clothed David with his armor. So Saul wanted to prepare David naturally for the fight that was getting ready to happen. He decided to give David his armor. And though I'm pretty sure he had good intentions, this armor would not have fit David. David compared to Saul and the rest of these men was probably smaller. It didn't fit. So the question here is, what are you wearing or carrying that is not meant for you? Are you wearing something that someone else has put on to you because they thought it would help you in your walk? Are you wearing something or carrying something that someone has given you because they thought it would help you? And a lot of the times we try to help people. And um, this actually came up in a study that I'm doing with Tessa Afshar where uh, we try to help people and we have, you know, good intentions in doing so, but we forget. That we can't help them. Only God can help them. And because we try to help them and not giving them godly advice, we tend to make it worse for them. And if David would have went on that battlefield with that armor, I'm pretty sure it would not have turned out the way it had. Because one, it was probably heavy. And two, it was probably really loose. So what is the point of wearing armor if it doesn't fit you? There's no point. Armor is supposed to fit you to protect every vital part of your body. But Saul wasn't thinking that. He was just like, okay, well, maybe, you know, might, you might need a little armor. Um, let's just, let's try to help you out. He wasn't thinking about the weight. He wasn't thinking about the fit. He wasn't thinking about if David knew how to use it. He just was thinking in his natural flesh, his natural state of mind, I need to help protect this person instead of relying on God. And I just, I love that I just made that connection to the study that I'm doing because that is so amazing. Um... Okay, so uh, going on to verse 30, 39, it says that David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. So David had never used armor. He was a shepherd. There was no point in armor. He had a staff. He had, I don't even know what the other thing is called. Because they shepherds have two kind of sticks, one with a hook and one without a hook. I'm going to call it a staff and a cane. It's probably not a cane. If I can remember, it's on the screen. But um, he wasn't used to that. He didn't know how to work that stuff. So... The question here is, do you test what others try to tell and show you? Do you test that against what you know, against what you're used to? Because a lot of the times, people will try to put armor on you that is not meant for you. They will try to give you tools that are not meant for you, and you cannot use them. You can try, and then you'll fail. So David already knew. He was like, nah, this, this is not going to work. So he then says, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. The armor was not the armor that David needed. Saul gave him physical armor, but David knew he needed the armor of God, okay? Um, he only needed that spiritual armor, not that of man, because it did not fit and it was heavy, which would have weighed him down in battle. You cannot use the tools or methods of another if it's not called to you to do so, okay? There are many weapons to use in many ways. We all have weapons, but they're different from each other. We're all called to do battle. But the way we do battle is going to be in different methods and different from each other. The tools that I use, I'm not going to tell someone else to go and use those tools because they might not know how to use those tools. I'm just going to say whatever tools God had, has given you, use it because God will use it for his glory regardless of what you're dealing with. And it took me so long, so long to understand that myself back then because I knew that I had a passion for dance I knew that I had a passion for writing and reading like those are my loves I loved reading and writing since a little girl like those were my favorite subjects math was one of my favorite subjects I enjoyed school as a whole um, I enjoyed history but 
I didn't care too much for remembering names and things like that. So it wasn't until literally this year that I was like, okay, I know now that the tools that God has given me, I'm supposed to use them. I can't try and be like other people. I can't try and be like other YouTubers. I can't try and be like other makeup artists. I cannot try and be like other dancers who do liturgical dance because there has been a point in my life where I've tried it. I, when I was a YouTuber, uh, when I was on a beauty channel, I tried to be like other beauty gurus. It didn't work. As a makeup artist, I tried to emulate other makeup artists. It didn't work. As a Christian YouTuber, I've seen, and I've talked about this, I've tried to do the cute little, you know, the little scenes, the little B-roll scenes with the coffees, but that don't work for me, okay? It, it just doesn't work for me, personally, because that's not the tools, that is not the way that God has um, called me to do things. It's not the tools he's given me, so I cannot use somebody else's tools, especially if I've ha I have not tested them, if I have not tried them, if he has not given them to me. So you have to be mindful of what someone is trying to give you, if you're even called to, to use it, and if you're not called to use it, have you tried to use it? Because if you tried to use it, then you would know you weren't called to use it. So if you're not called to use it, then use the tools that God has already given you. He's laid it out already. The things you've been doing in your life, continue to do them. The things that you've been using, continue to use them, and God will do the rest. As long as you are faithful to the things that he's given to, given to you, as long as you are faithful to... uh the talents and the hobbies he's given to you, those will be the things that will push you and propel you forward. But many times we don't think that. And it took me so long to really understand that. And um, I'm grateful that now I understand and now I get it because I'm happy with the hobbies and the talents and the tools that God has given me. I love writing. Writing is amazing to me. Like writing, journaling, whether it's writing, like I, writing is amazing. I can take five pages of notes and make a 29 page packet like I did for this that's just something I love writing that's just I digress we're gonna move on so um the cross reference I have for that is obviously Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 18 all about the armor of God so moving on um we see that David then takes it off it says so David took them off he didn't hesitate to lay aside that which would hinder him from victory there was no middle ground for him um he was all about trusting God and him alone and a lot of the times, we're hesitant to release those things that are hindering us. And I know for me, that has been the case sometimes. Um, where I'm just like, God, you sure? I mean, I know it don't work, but do I got to let it go? Do I have to to, to, to just like, uh, let it go? I don't want to let it go because I'm kind of enjoying it, even though it doesn't work for me, even though it doesn't fit for me. Um, I kind of like it. So do I have to let it go? But David said, okay, it don't work. Let me just take it off. He was not hesitant in doing so. And because he wasn't hesitant, he was able to go straight into that battle and win and get victory. So if you're currently carrying something that is not meant for you to carry, if you're currently dealing with something or wearing something that's weighing you down, take it off. It's not yours. It's not meant for you. And don't be hesitant to do so because when you hesitate, it elongates the process of what you have to go through. And yeah, that ain't fun. It ain't fun okay there are so many things I recall that I could have eliminated the long process but I just did not want to give it up I didn't want to put it down even though it was weighing me down I didn't want to give it up and that's even the case when you're dealing with sin um when you're dealing with guilt shame let it go God does not give us guilt he does not give us shame that is of the enemy so when you're dealing with that a lot of the times we don't like to let it go there have been cases when I felt guilty about things and I know guilt is not of God, but I felt so guilty and so bad about what I've done that I was just like, okay, well, I don't know if I can let it go and da, 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 da. And that then just elongated the process of me getting back to God. Let it go. If you're dealing with guilt, let it go. If you're dealing with shame, let it go. If you're dealing with disappointment, let it go. It's weighing you down. It's weighing down your faith because now you're dealing with that and the enemy knows how to play up on our emotions and our feelings. I he knows it. So let it go. Um, do you ever find yourself compromising your spiritual armor for natural armor? And that was a question I thought of when I saw that David took them off immediately. He didn't hesitate because there are some times where I know I'm supposed to pick up the helmet of salvation. Or I'm supposed to pick up my sword, which is the word of God. And I'll be like, nah, I ain't gonna pick that up. Like there are times now, I may seem all prim and proper to you guys, but there are moments that I don't share a lot of the times where I'm just like, I don't feel like reading my Bible today. I'm not going to read it. Knowing that I should read my Bible. So instead of reading my Bible, I go pick up a biblical fiction book or I go watch a YouTube video. That is not the way. 
there are times where God has to be like, okay, sweetie, daughter, let's go get it together. That is not what I called you to get your spiritual armor, not the natural armor. There are times where I want to fight somebody. I might be short, I might be tiny, but yeah. Uh, so um, there are times where I literally want to hit people because they, they have pissed me off so bad. Um, but then I had to remember, I can't walk around in my flesh wanting to fight people. You can't do it because it's not of God. God didn't say, go throw your hands at this person. No. He said, get on your knees and cry out to me. Pray to me. Read your word. Use the sword, the word of God. And then there's times where I'm just like, well, do I have to? Do I want to? I will compromise my spiritual armor for natural armor. I will compromise my spiritual armor for the pleasures of the world. And I'm not just talking about sex, okay? We're not talking about sex right now. When I say the pleasures of the world, I mean like watching movies or getting on YouTube or reading a book, um, listening to music. Those are pleasures of the world compared to what God tells me to do with my spiritual armor there are times where I compromise that and it's not good to compromise it I don't do it often now because I'm I'm more aware of what I'm doing so I always take a minute to be like okay God is this what I should be doing if not then okay I've noticed that 2020 has allowed me to seek God face in everything I pray a lot more not out loud, but internally, I'm consistently praying like, God, do I do this or do I do that? Do I say this or do I say that? Do I go here or do I stay home? Like, I'm praying a lot more and I love it. Okay, so we're on to verse 40. Um, verse 40 says, then he took his staff in hand. So this means that he used the tools he was familiar with, what God used before he would use again. So the staff in hand, he used that as a shepherd. He took them same tools and was like, all right, you know what? I ain't going to take this armor. I ain't going to take this sword. I'm going to take this staff right here. And I'm going to go with the tools that I know that God used to, to, to kill this bear and this lion. I'm going to take them same tools to go to the battle. Then it says that he chose for himself five smooth stones from the book. So a lot of the times people say that this is foreshadowing for the death to come for David and his brothers. Because um, we see that Goliath has four relatives to come if you read 2 Samuel 18 and 22. And I apologize if you guys hear any noise in the background. So apologize. I'm trying to make this uh, video as quick as possible. But um, so that is pretty much foreshadowing for the death of David and his four giant brothers. And you'll read that if you know the story of Gath and all that um again so that scripture if you want to know about the foreshadowing is going to be second samuel 18 verse 22 so then it says that he put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had and his sling was in hand use what you know and trust god to use and deliver you use the exact tools that you used before and trust god to use those tools and you to deliver you from whatever you're dealing with and I had to come to that realization again with my love for writing and reading. I had to realize that I can use those tools to allow God to use me to provide for me and my son. So it's been such an amazing experience to create notes. It's been such an experience to create Bible study videos and to make video content on YouTube and to work with publishing companies and to work with authors on books. It's, it's just been amazing. And a lot of the times I'm not getting paid a financial amount, but I'm getting paid something in, in, in spiritual um, insight, if that makes sense. And it's been so amazing. It reminds me that even though the world tells you to have the American dream. I don't want that dream. I don't want it. I want the dream that God has already for me. I want what God has stored up for me. I want what he has designed for me. And it's been a journey. I ain't gonna lie. It's been a journey. And there's sometimes I'm just like, God, I can't do it because I don't have this and I don't got this and I don't got the money and I don't got the finances. But he always pulls through for me when I least expect it. And it's been an amazing journey. Like, I, I don't know how much I can say that because it's been such an amazing journey. When I reflect on my past and how I was, now keep in mind, I've grown up in the church all my life. All my life, I've grown up in the church. Um, I've been a Christian all my life. I got baptized between, I think between the ages of 10 and 12. I can't remember exactly the year. I think it was like 10, 11. Don't remember, but I remember the service because we had to wear all white and they had to move the organ because the organ was over the pool that we had. And I, I literally like remember it in my head remember the day I just don't remember my age but we had to wear all white and I was nervous I was nervous because they had to dunk you in there but like I remember 
growing up in the church, I remember being excited to study the word of God. But then throughout the days of the week, I just, I wasn't in the word of God unless it was Saturday and Sunday because I knew I was going to church or Wednesday when we had a uh, Bible study or Thursday when we had choir rehearsal or Friday when I had a youth service or Saturday when I had to go to dance rehearsal. Like I grew up in a church, going to church five days a week, four days a week. I knew that, but I didn't have a real relationship with God. It wasn't me and God. It was me, my mom, then God, or me and my leaders from church and then God. But it wasn't until I got to my senior year of uh, high school when things really started to go left field. Like, I mean, completely left field for me. And um, from my senior year of high school up into uh, my third year of college, I was in a complete just lack of everything i stopped reading the word of god i stopped listening to gospel music i stopped going to like i literally was like my mom's like, you going to church now i'm not going to church i don't feel like going to church and i was i was 18 at the time 18 19 20 so i didn't have to if i didn't want to there were times she had to literally like no you're going to church and just like i don't want to go to church like no no i i just don't want to and it's it's interesting because a lot of the times you hear people say oh they're shocked that uh pk kids or kids that grew up in church turn into these heathens or uh they turn from god but you have to realize just because you grew up in church all your life does not mean that you personally have a relationship with god just because you're a pk kid does not mean that you personally have a relationship with god and people fail to understand that being a christian is about personal relationship it is not about religion it is not about rituals routines no it is about a personal relationship with God. And because you don't have a personal relationship with God, there's nothing that anyone else can do. They can pray for you. They can help you. They can talk to you. They can give you advice. But until you get to that point of saying, I want to make that relationship with God, I want to build that relationship with God, I want to have that relationship with God, you're not going to have the relationship with God. So it doesn't matter if you're a PK kid. It doesn't matter if you been in the church since you was a newborn it doesn't matter if you've been in church for 10 20 years if you do not have a personal personal relationship with god between you and the father you and the son you and the holy spirit it doesn't matter you're not gonna know what to do and i think people really don't understand that being a christian is not about religion i hate religion discussions i hate it it bothers me because my god is not a god who cares about rituals who cares about a to-do list, a checklist, and you being this perfect prim popper person. No, the only perfect person there is is Jesus, okay? It 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 really grinds my gears sometimes. So I'm completely going on a left field. So we're going to go ahead to verse 42. Um, verse 42 says, And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. So nothing about David made Goliath fear him. He saw David as worthless, literally worthless um i think i did look up the word disdain let me just look for the definition sheet yeah so disdained in um hebrew is balza which means to despise or to see as worthless so he saw him as worthless he did not see him as anything to bear okay and a lot of the times when we see things and it's the funny things that uh it's, it's, it's the things that we don't expect to be afraid of that actually causes us to be afraid okay so um then it says, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. So like Saul, Goliath tries to discredit David's worth from his appearance. David was handsome, he was clean, and he was healthy, okay? Keep in mind, just like Saul, Saul had disqualified him because of his appearance. Appearance, And now Goliath is looking at David compared to all these other men who I'm pretty sure are sweaty. They probably got dirt all over their faces and stuff. Their hair's probably a hot mess. They probably look just, they, they probably stank, okay? David come on the scene, he's all nice and handsome and healthy looking and he's all clean. He smells like a clean person. He's like, what am I scared for? Like, why? What, what, what do I need to be afraid of this little boy for, right? So like David, we won't always be what others expect of us. God's expectations are different from man's. And I, I don't even have to elaborate on that, okay? What others expect of us, no, is what God expects of us, okay? So we're going to move ahead to verse 43. He says, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? This is a direct insult to David's manhood. And um, it wasn't until I studied this that I really began to understand what dog meant. Um, Because to me, dog is just, it's an animal. It's a dog. It's an animal, right? But if you look it up in the Hebrew, it's not. Um, dog in Hebrew is 
Caleb, and it is a name that is given to a male temple prostitute. So take that in for a minute. It's not the animal with one of four legs, no. It is a male temple prostitute. So just like they call the women's the Zona, a dog is a male prostitute. So because David looked handsome and healthy and clean, probably smelled good, you're calling him a dog? You're insulting his manhood now. And again, it's not that Goliath specifically said David is a, a dog. He's Goliath is referring to himself as a dog, but because he's referring to himself as a dog, it is an indirect insult on David's manhood because a dog is, is a male prostitute and male prostitutes were pretty. So because he looked ruddy and good looking and handsome, really mm, so he took it that far so that honestly made me laugh a lot because i was like they really had jokes back then and i don't know if you guys ever like read the word of god and you start laughing at the things that they say because i'm just like did he really just say that like bruh did he really just say that and when you begin to understand the context of each word according to how it was written back then it just makes everything so much easier the cross reference for that verse um, for verse 43 is going to be Deuteronomy 23 and 18. So then it says, uh, the Philistine cursed David by his gods. So this is where it becomes a, a true spiritual battle because it wasn't now just this Philistine versus this Israelite. Now you're cursing out David, the son of God. Now you're cursing out the Israelites, the people of God, by using your gods, your false gods. Hmm. So now he tries to use his gods to come against the true God. You can't do that. Don't don't do it. I think it's interesting when people try to uh really they, they try to battle you, but then they talk about their personal gods, and I'm just like, your God can't trump my God because my God is the one true God. He has a power, he has power and authority overall. And one thing I will never understand is how people, um, and this is no shade or disrespect to anyone i am genuinely genuinely like i'm interested to understand how people can have all of these gods right all of these various gods god for water god for air god for sun god for nature god for this god for that and have to sacrifice so much of themselves for this said god but get nothing back in return whereas my father the one true god doesn't require much of me actually he sacrificed his only son for me who died on the cross rose again to reconcile me back to my god so that i could have a personal relationship with god yet you have several gods that you probably can see because you make idols of them but you don't have a personal relationship with them like i can call my god father I can cry out Abba. I can call him a friend, a confidant, a confidant, excuse me. I can call him my healer. I can call him my protector, my provider, my sustainer, my maintainer. I, I can call him so many different things. But I see other people in their religions and they can only call their God by their name or by what they do. And I, I just find it so interesting, so... That's just me. I just personally find that interesting, but I digress. So um, verse 45 says, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. So now David can see that there's this massive amount of armor and weapon. I think it's about 215 pounds total um, of th this, you know, weapons and, and armor that Goliath has on top of being nine foot nine inches, right? Um, he doesn't discredit the weight. He doesn't discredit the armor. He doesn't discredit the weapons or the height. Okay, keep that in mind. He's not discrediting it. He can see it. He understands it. He's like, okay, I see you coming at me with all this stuff. I can see it. But then he says, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. This solidifies that David knew who he was as a child of God. He understand who God is in his life. Um, and he knew he was sent to represent God on this battlefield. He knew. He said, yeah, okay, you might come to me with this weapon. You might come to me looking all tall and big, but I'm coming to you with a real weapon in the name of my father. I'm coming to you with all that I need, my father. 
Um, so when you are without a physical weapon, the only weapon you really need is his name. Just by saying his name, by saying the name of Jesus, by saying the name of God, there is so much power in that, that many of us don't tend to understand. Let me just take a sip of my, my cappuccino. But there is so much power in the name of God, in the name of Christ. Just saying Jesus multiple times is enough. But because of the world, we tend to think that it's not about our words, but it's about what we can bring physically. And a lot of the times you're not supposed to do anything physically. All you need to think about is the name of God, the name of Christ. That's it. Say it. That's it. That's all you need. You don't need a physical weapon. Then the next thing is, whose name are you battling in? Are you battling in God's name or yourself or in, in your name? Um, when it comes to arguing with people <laughs> or wanting to have a fight with people, what are you thinking about? Because I know we're, we're human, okay? Let me just say that. We're human, period. But there comes a time when we're, we're put in situations when we're ready to fight. Like, we're ready to fight. Oh, you're not going to, like, especially when people... Example, when people argue about religion and want to fight, like literally fight over religion, whose name are you fighting in? Like, are you fighting in your name or are you really fighting in God's name? Because if you're fighting in God's name, God does not tell you to fight. So therefore, if God doesn't tell you to fight, then you're fighting in your personal name. So David understood I'm not going to come to you in my power, in my name. I'm not going to come to you in the power, in the name of Saul. He could have been like, oh, I'm coming for King Saul. That's the king. Nah, he said, no, I'm coming in the name of the Lord of hosts. Then he says, the God of the armies of Israel. So he knew he wasn't alone. If you read Deuteronomy 21 through 5, again, it talks about how you don't have to go to battle by yourself. God goes before you and with you. So not only was he there in the flesh, but he also had God with him. God was before him. God was with him, standing with him. God was behind him, protecting him. So, what? Like, really? So, um, then it says, whom you have defied. So, once again, he lets Goliath know that this was just not, this was bigger than just two men arguing. This was bigger than just two armies arguing. No, this was now about God. Because now, Goliath not only disrespected God by disrespecting his people and his very children, but you also disrespected God by cursing us in the name of your God. So, now you're putting your gods against my God. That doesn't work for me. Mm -mm. Doesn't work at all. David made sure to let him know that you're not just defying, you're not just messing with me. You're not just messing with the children of God, you're now disrespecting my God, like, in multiple ways, okay? So, verse 46, it says, This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. So, David now shows confidence in God and not in himself. There are some times when we can boast about our Father in the face of our fears and enemies. Um, You can read Psalms 44, verse 6 and 8. There are times when we can boast about God. We can't boast about ourselves because we do nothing of ourselves. Everything is through Jesus and through God. But you can boast about God when you need to. I know I do. It's like, how you did that? Oh, I didn't do it. God did it. How you did? Oh, I didn't do it. God did it. My Lord, my Savior, he did it. I didn't do it. Well, how did you find that out, God? Well, how did you get that, God? It's not of me. It is all of God. So you have the power to boast in your father. He is your father. Just like you would naturally boast about your mother and father in, in, in the natural, you can boast about your father in the spiritual. There's no difference. He says, I will strike you and take your head from you from from you so he's saying he will cut him at the head therefore cutting the root of the philistines boldness sometimes you have to cut things at the root you have to cut the head of it so that it doesn't come back up okay then it says that all the earth may know that there is a god in israel so goliath's death by the hands of david was going to be a message to the people of god about his might and it was all going to be for the glory of god so this miraculous battle that took place with David and Goliath and a slingshot and a rock was not about David. It was for the glory of God so that people could see that God was on the side of his people so that they could see that God could do anything, even with a sling and a rock. So if you go to verse 47, it says, then all this assembly shall know. So Goliath's death would also be a reminder to the people of God that he is faithful. Sometimes we as believers need reminders. We need them because we sometimes forget God. 
Just like at the beginning, the Israelites forgot who God was. King Saul forgot who God was. They forgot his power and his might. They forgot his strength. But then you had David who was like, no, I'm going to come. I'm going to do this. I'm going to stand up for my father. I'm going to stand up for my people. I am going to kill this giant. I'm going to kill this thing that you all fear. And in doing so, I'm going to remind you of the faithfulness of God, of the power of God, of the strength and the might of God, because I'm not going to do it the way you're doing it. I'm going to do it the way that God has already brought me to, to do it with the tools that he gave me as the little shepherd boy that y'all thought was not nothing. And he wasn't cocky about it. It was just how things happened. So he says, for the battle is the Lord's. There are battles that go beyond human concepts and hands, and they're the ones that only God can win. There are going to be things that we face that we cannot fight for a lot of the times the battles that we are facing in our lives are not meant for us they're meant for God and um this reminds me of my mom um I'm not going to share like in depth but she's currently dealing with some things and um sometimes she gets overwhelmed sometimes she wants to cry out sometimes she just wants to go out and just just be do her and I have to remind her like no you can't you can't do that you have to remain where you are you have to stay steadfast you have to continue on because this is not about you. People only disrespect you because they see God in you. And because the world does not love Christ, they do not care for Christ. The world is going to oppose you because of the God in you, because you are a follower of Christ. And um, I have to remind her sometimes, like, you remember when he did this, that, and the third? Then he going to do it again. The same God back then is the same God right now. That's a song, ain't it? Um, the cross reference for that for verse 47 is going to be Deuteronomy 31 and 6 and then Judges 7 18. So then it says in verse 48 that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. So he didn't allow fear to stop him. He didn't allow doubt to creep in. He didn't allow anxiety to um, freak him out. Um, he didn't give anything a chance to stop him. And a lot of the times when we are supposed to react immediately, we don't. And then that allows fear and doubt and anxiety and panic to set in and i know for me that has been the case i am currently working on a book i want to to create a book and there are times where i just like all right i'm getting on a computer i start typing right away and then there are times where i'll have the computer open i'll have the document open and then i'm just like all right i don't want to do this and then because now i don't want to do it now i'm like dude can i really do it can i really write a book can i really put something life-giving in this book can I really share my testimony in this book can I really do it oh, I don't think I can do it I can't do this this is too I start to let fear and doubt creep in and that's not good so going on to verse 49 it says then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth so this is a complete miracle okay you went on a battlefield where all these men had all this armor, they had all these weapons, and you just killed him with a stone and a sling? Like, that was it? That was it? Um, and then it says that uh, not only did David use weapons that were not seen or conventional on the battlefield, but he trusted God and God ain't true. So, what's interesting here is that... Um, if you read the book of First Samuel in chapter 5, there's a situation with the idol of Dagon. Um, the way that Goliath falls, because it says he fell on his face to the earth. That is the same way that the idol of Dagon fell on his face to the earth. If you read First Samuel 5 verses 2 through 5, okay? Um, it also let me know that David used what he knew. And it reminds me of the story of Jael in Judges um, 4 verses 17 to 21 where how she used what was available to her i'm actually going to turn to it because i i love the story of jael i don't know why it's it's such a simple story but i love it oh i'm going back i need to go forward <laughs> so i'm gonna go to judges chapter 4 verses 17 to 21 and i'm gonna pop it up on the screen for you guys okay so it says however sisera had fled away on foot to the tent of jael the wife of heber the Kenite, I think that's how you say that. For there was peace between Jebin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber, the Kenite. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me, do not fear. And when he had turned aside with her into the tent, she covered him with a blanket. 
Then he said to her, please give me a little water to drink for I am thirsty. So she opened a jug of milk, gave him drink and covered him. And he said to her, stand at the door of the tent. And if any man comes and inquires of you, says, is there any man here? You shall say no. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a tent peg and took a hammer in hand and went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple and it went down into the ground for he was fast asleep and weary and so he died um so this is basically with um prophetess deborah uh where she basically tells um what is his name barack she tells barack to go and fight and he's like no come with me um we need you to come with us so then god says that um since you don't trust me enough i'm going to deliver the hand uh, the head of sisyrus into a woman's hand so this is a random woman named jael um who you know she invites this 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 man and sisera into her home and she immediately says don't be afraid of me just come on in and i'm pretty sure jael must have had some type of revelation from god or whatever there, there had to be something some type of connection or relationship with god for her to pull this off okay so um what interests me is that he immediately asked for water she gave him milk now water will quench your thirst but milk especially if it's warm it will put you to sleep okay we give babies milk to help them sleep right so she gives him this milk. She makes him comfortable. She's using things that she has, okay? She's making this man comfortable. And then what amazes me is that she didn't go looking for a knife. She didn't go looking for a fork, a spoon. I mean, back in, back in that time, I don't know what they used to eat. But she didn't look for a knife. She didn't look for uh, any fire. She didn't even look for a pot and a pan, okay? She picked up a tent peg and a hammer. A tent peg and a hammer she used what was available to her it was available it was there so she used that very thing to kill Sisera which of course was already given if you read chapter 4 um in Judges you'll understand but I just thought it was interesting that she used exactly what, what, what was available to her so not only do you use the tools that you used before and that you're used to but you use what is available to you at the time and at that time all she had was a tent peg and a tent peg is literally a nail that they use to hold the tents down if you guys like watch those old uh movies and shows she used a nail now keep in mind they used nails to nail jesus to the cross with a hammer i just i love the correlations that i see when i'm reading the old testament in correlation to christ and his death and just ah okay anyways <laughs> we're almost done we're almost done so um back in okay verse 50 it says so david prevailed over the philistines with a sling and a stone he prevailed but the, the key thing is is that none of the glory went to him all the glory went to god it was for god and that alone so then the question becomes are you seeking victory for god's glory or your own because if you're seeking glory for yourself then it's not going to prevail it's going to fail okay if it's for you and not god you're going to fail at it it's everything is supposed to be for god because we were created to be a representation of god we were created in the image of god we were created to glorify him to worship him so if you're trying to give yourself glory now you're become you're trying to become your own god and that's not gonna work against the true god it just doesn't verse 51 says david ran and stood over the philistine took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head so now we see that david is making certain that goliath is dead he also didn't give goliath a time or chance to get up and he fulfilled his promise back from verse 46 where he told goliath that he was going to cut off his head and this is how he became a hero of faith and you can see that in hebrews 11 verses 32 to 34 it talks about the hebrews of faith so then it says uh in 51 that when the philistines saw that their champion was dead they fled so if you read the beginning of 1 Samuel 17, um, you can see that there is a there there is a sort of a challenge given from Goliath that if, you know, we the Philistines win, then you guys have to give yourself up to us. And if you if we lose against you, then we have to give ourselves up to you. So now at this point we see that they went back against their agreement from 1 Samuel verse 17 and 1 Samuel 17 verse 9, excuse me, um, which shows us that the enemy never sticks to the promises that he makes if it does not benefit him there would have been no benefit for the philistines to honestly give themselves up to the Israelites, none whatsoever it would have been their loss and what people need to remember is no matter how something how how good something may sound no matter how good something may look the enemy is not going to keep to his promises if it does not benefit him and his camp he's just not it doesn't work that way 
Um, and then finally, we have verse 52, which we're going to end at, where it says, now the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines. So because they saw the faith of David um, and they saw that their main fear was now defeated, it prompted them to move into action. And the question now becomes, what fears do you have to overcome to help someone else overcome? David overcame their fear to help them move forward. And sometimes God will send us into someone's life to help them overcome their fear. And because we help them deal with that fear, they now can move forward and do the things of God. Um, if it wasn't for David, no telling how long they would have been in that valley waiting on someone to kill Goliath. Okay? So, that's that. So, we have some takeaway points that I have for you guys from this study, okay? So, the first is that faith in simple objects dedicated to God will accomplish his divine purpose. And we see that in verse 40. Um, all you need is faith in God. And God will tell you what to use and how to use it um don't try to use the weapons of another because god didn't give it to you and be confident that he can use what you already have god is a powerful father he can use it all but he gives each individual person a different method a different tool a different way we are not to go beyond what he has given us unless he instructs us to if he does not instruct you to go beyond what he's given you then that means he wants you to use what you have and have faith in him not in the objects not in yourself have faith in god because god with faith can do anything he can move mountains i mean that's what the scripture says right the second point is that believers should not be intimidated by the size of their problems or circumstances and you can see this in verse 41 and 42 you need to trust in god and remember his faithfulness whatever is in front of you may look big but when you put god into your in the forefront of your mind when you remember how faithful he is when you remember the faith that you have in him nothing is bigger than him nothing is greater than him god is the source of all he is the creator of all god created everything but man perversed some things because of the enemy so therefore if god created everything don't you think he can overcome whatever is in front of you if he created it all if he's the source of everything the third thing is that faith in God is tested when the unsaved mock and threaten us. Um, and that is verse 43 and verse 44. Um, faith in God is tested. So the Israelites were tested. Okay. They were tested with Goliath. This, this, this Philistine who was uncircumcised mocked their God. And the Israelites said nothing but shaking fear. But then David came and saw that. And he said, you know what? I'm going to stand up for God because this man is mocking my God. He is making fun of my God. And now I have to stand up for God because no one else on my side will do so know that we are on god's side so we can speak boldly to our critics and our enemies from verse 45 and 47 um because you are on the side of god and god is on your side if someone comes against you you have the power to stand up and say something against them now you do it with respect and love of course you do everything with respect and love but you have that power to stand up against your enemies and speak against your enemies boldly because of the God in you and who you serve. Um, the fifth one is that God will deliver whom it pleases him to deliver and we can trust him completely. And this is in verse 48 and 49. God can do whatever he wants. If he don't want to deliver you, he don't have to. If he wants to, he will. Simple as that. He's God. God does not need permission to do anything at all. He doesn't need my permission. He can do what he wants. But because he's such a loving father, because he's such a faithful father, he does let you know ahead of time. He does um, speak with you. He communes with you if you allow yourself to be open to hear it. Then we have um, that God empowers believers to slay the giants in their lives. And this is in verse 50 and 51. And sometimes you have to confront your fears to progress and grow. Sometimes God will leave that fear there in front of you because you have to confront it to move forward. If it wasn't for David confronting that fear that the Philist the Israelites had, they would not have been able to move forward on that battlefield. Simple as that. You have to confront your fears. There are times where God is not going to remove the situation that you're dealing with or the people that you're living with because he wants you to confront that. Because in you confronting that, you're now getting experience and now you're growing to whatever it is that you need to grow into and to progress forward. Um, and then lastly, David shows us how Jesus comes to our aid in times of struggle. So for the question I asked in the icebreaker of who we are or who you are in the story of David and Goliath, if you said that you are David, you're not wrong, but you're also not right. There are times where you can be like David. 
But in the scheme of the story, you're more like the Israelites and David is actually going to be Jesus in your life. There are times when we, like the Israelites, are facing circumstances and fears and, and situations that look so grand, look so big, like Goliath was for the Israelites. And we quiver, we shake, we, 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 we sit in this fear, we sit in this, this gloominess and don't want to face it. But then like David, that's when Jesus comes and he defeats that fear for us. He defeats that circumstance. He defeats that giant. And because he defeated it, now we can move forward and go out and do the rest of whatever needs to be done. That is who Jesus is in this story. Jesus is David. And we are like the Israelites. Goliath is anything that is stopping you from moving forward. So whether it be a person that you're dealing with, whether it be um, a situation, a circumstance, a fear that you have, um, doubt, anxiety, anything that is stopping you from moving forward in your life and doing the things that God has called you to, that is your Goliath. So, after that, um, there are just some chapter review questions. So, I'll show you guys quickly. There are just some questions, and you can actually fill them out on the paper. Um, but there's like six questions I have for, there for you guys that are like a chapter review of what's going on. Um, and then there are some personal reflection questions. I gave six, right? Yeah, six of them. Um, and then they're basically, what are giants that people may face today? And some giants that I think of are um, lust. Uh, there are some people who are have addictions, any type of addiction, sexual addiction, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, any type of addiction. So those are the, like the main two that I think of. Um, then how can you face the fears in your life? How can you face the things that you're dealing with? And I know that I can't face them without God. I can't face them without Christ. It's just not happening. Um, the next question I had was, why does God prefer to use people who appear to be weak to do battle against those who look strong? And I thought that was an interesting question that I came up with because when you look in the word of God, you see that even with the story of Jael, Jael is this woman. She's a, a wife, a woman. And compared to Sisera, who I think he was a commander at the time of an army. I honestly don't remember exactly who he was, but read Judges 4 and you'll know. But compared to Sisera, this man, she's weak. She is weak compared to this man, but he used Jael to kill Sisera. He used David to kill Goliath. That lets me know that he's always going to use the weak to confound the strong, the foolish to confound the wise, the young to confound the old. God likes to do the opposite of what the world thinks. He's not going to use a strong person to win against a strong person because he can't get no victory out of that. He can't get no glory, excuse me, out of that. But if he used someone who's weaker than a strong person god gets all the glory then there are some other questions like what ways does god stand with you during hard times how can you prepare for spiritual warfare and how can you apply the scripture to your life um so those are just personal questions and i have uh this sheet here with just notes i have like four pages i think of notes one two three four maybe five five pages of notes and then at the end i put walk by faith not by sight god is ever with you it's just a cute little thing you can put it in a picture frame or whatever but um yeah this was a really short quick step. it wasn't short this video was probably longer than 45 minutes we'll see um but yeah i hope you guys enjoyed this video um it was definitely a different type of video for me and um i'm excited and glad that i did it this way i'm definitely going to try to do more sit down bible studies with you all um try to keep them shorter because I'm pretty sure this one was long because I like to talk. But um, this really was a deep study really just on fear, faith, and victory. Um, because a lot of the times we're taught to look at David and Goliath and we're like, yeah, be like David. Be like David. No. You should be like David. I'm not saying that you shouldn't, but David is Jesus. So I really hope that this study blessed you all. I hope that it was helpful for you guys. Um, and I hope that you were able to gain something from this study again if you want the notes they are available even if you're watching the study later on down the line they are available on the blog just click the link down below it is 29 pages of notes <laughs> um and yeah that's pretty much it so yeah i'm just going to pray us out now and uh then we're gonna end this video
So Heavenly Father, we come to you now just thanking you for this opportunity and this time to spend together to, to understand your word more, to be able to learn more about fear, faith, and victory through the story of David and Goliath, God. We thank you for reading David and seeing Jesus through that. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to grow in our walk with you to remain faithful and allowing this word to really just sit and minister within us lord i'm asking that those who watch this video now will be able to take from this study and be able to grow in their walk lord and anyone who watches this video later i'm praying for them as well that they're able to allow this word to take root into their their minds and their hearts god and i thank you for just using me to speak a word to encourage your people to minister a word to your people lord i'm asking now that we are departing that we all just have a blessed week a blessed day a blessed evening a blessed morning whenever the time that they are watching this lord i'm asking that you continue to be with us to continue to re to remind us of your faithfulness to, to remind us to remain um prayerful to stay in a prayerful state of mind and just to always keep our faith higher than anything else lord um and we understand that the fear of you is the beginning of all so we thank you for this time we thank you for this opportunity and um we bless your holy name amen so thank you guys for joining me today um i definitely will do more sit down videos with you guys i will still do my journaling bible videos of course i love those but um i wanted to try a different setup a different setup a different method and um step out on faith uh and try something new so i hope this video was helpful and um, if you are a new believer or if you're, excuse me, an unbeliever and through this video you were able to learn more about Christ, then I invite you to join the family, to become a daughter of God, a son of God. And you do that by confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and Savior. And if you confess with your, your mouth that Jesus is Lord and Savior and you make him Lord of your life and you understand that he died for you and rose again for you to reconcile you back to the father then you now are a part of the family so i i pray that you 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 do that you confess with your mouth that he is lord and savior and you give your heart to him and once you do that i welcome you we welcome you to the family of christ so that is it for this video and i'll see you guys in the next one bye